Welcome to a powerful video session with the legendary Jim Rohn. In this training, Jim will share with you some invaluable insights and techniques to help you develop a winning mindset that can transform your life. Jim was a renowned motivational speaker and entrepreneur who inspired millions of people around the world with his teachings on personal development, success, and leadership. His wisdom and practical strategies have helped countless individuals achieve their goals and unlock their full potential. So get ready to learn from one of the greatest minds in the personal development industry as Jim Rohn shares his mindset training with you. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. What would make you an attractive person in the marketplace so you have the best chance to get the best job, to get the best pay, to have the best opportunity, work with the best people, be welcome at the best tables of learning and enterprise, to sit at the conference table of promise and future. How do you get there? Some things to remember. This first little part I call acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Now, part of our learning affects us in the marketplace. The skills we've developed affects us in the marketplace. You might have had to go to school to work in a certain segment of the marketplace. If you're going to be a doctor, you've got to go to the proper school. If you're going to be a lawyer, you've got to go to the proper school. But there's something else now that affects us all in the marketplace that I want to deal with here. And that's called behavior in the marketplace. Not just your skills, not just your learning, not just what you know, but how you behave. Key phrase, the things that make you obviously a good person, an acceptable person, or unacceptable. First of all, all of us must study our marketplace as to what might be acceptable or unacceptable. But let's cover some of the obvious, and that'll lead to the rest of the list. I've just got three or four here to cover, and then you can think about the rest and ponder those. Here's one thing to remember in the marketplace. You must be ultra conservative in the marketplace. Ultra conservative in your behavior because this determines your future. This determines your paycheck. This determines the circles you can get into and the ones you can't get into. I've got some examples here and you'll see where I'm going. Here's number one, your language. The language you use in the marketplace has so much to do with your paycheck. Now, in some areas, that may not be totally true, where you could use bad language and tell dirty stories and cuss all day long, and it wouldn't make any difference. You know, if you're around people that cuss all day long and tell dirty stories, what difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference. But if you would like to exercise your skill and ability in another segment of the marketplace, here's one thing you might have to correct, or you might have to at least watch carefully, and that's your language in the marketplace. So jot this down. Be ultra-conservative in your language in the marketplace. Otherwise, you may destroy parts of the market that would gladly accept you and your product and your service if your language wasn't so unacceptable. The guy says, well, I'll tell dirty stories and cuss wherever I please, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it'll cost you. In some areas of business in the marketplace, it's going to cost you. Here's a guy that makes 100000 a year, could make 250000 easy. The other 150,000 disappears because of his bad language in the marketplace. He's unacceptable in some circle. They won't listen to his story, even though he has something good to share. So you see where I'm going here? Language in the marketplace. Here's what's the safest. Save your jokes for the bar or the pub. Don't put them on the marketplace. Or the inner circle, you know, where all the stories and stuff may be acceptable as you trade stories. But in the marketplace, you've got to be ultra-conservative, shift gears if you have a problem, shift gears, especially in the marketplace, and make sure that it isn't costing you a big share of your marketplace unduly. Because there's no use suffering an extra hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year income simply because you're careless with your language in the marketplace. So of all the places not to be careless, it's in the marketplace concerning your language. So do you see where I'm going here? Next is habits. You just got to be careful of those. Smoking. Guy walks into an office and says, where's your ashtrays? How come you don't have any ashtrays? Well, ashtrays probably mean what? No ashtrays mean. Right? They don't smoke here. Oh, yeah, I forgot. 
So what I'm saying now, I'm not saying right or wrong to smoke. I'm just saying be careful in the marketplace that you aren't disturbing and wiping out and closing the door on a market you could enjoy simply because you're a bit careless about your habits. Habits. Now, I don't smoke, so I don't have this challenge for me, except a fine cigar after a unique meal. Some places around the world still know how to prepare a gentleman's cigar. It's kind of an interesting experience, mostly for show. But as long as you know which end to dip in the brandy, right? But you see where I'm going here now on habits, habits. Zig Ziglar talked about the man who was late, who was late. I'm telling you, there's some circles, if you're late, you're not welcome anymore. You say, well, I've been late all my life, you know, if people don't like that, that's too bad. I'm saying that's okay. You can have that attitude if you want to, but what if it cost you $100,000 a year? Wouldn't you reconsider? That's too much to pay for the luxury of some habit that you could easily correct and maybe enjoy the benefits of a marketplace that's been closed up until now. This is all I'm saying. Take a look at your habits. Take a look at your language. Here's another one, your dress. Now, sometimes dress changes regionally. In San Francisco on a business day, they wouldn't expect you to look like West Palm Beach. If you dress like West Palm Beach on a business day in San Francisco, somebody will, they'll treat you casual, right? Not appropriate dress. So part of this is company, part of it is region, part of it is locality, part of it is community. What's acceptable in the marketplace on a conservative basis, what would be acceptable to everyone in San Francisco? To be dressed conservatively. In West Palm Beach, you can have a casual business dress, perfectly acceptable. The key is to find out so that you don't cost yourself market that you could enjoy. You don't cost yourself customers that you could have. You don't cost yourself people that would gladly join and be part of it except for these difficulties. I had to learn some of this stuff. All of us have to learn the social graces and what's acceptable. The white socks don't go with the black tuxedo. I mean, some things you just have to learn. What if a guy called on farmers in his tuxedo? See, the word would spread. You should see this clown. So now that's the severe side, but here's what I'm asking you. Check your dress. Check your clothes, check your attitude, check your behavior, check your language, check your habits, especially in the marketplace where you get paid. No use slamming the doors you don't need to slam. No use shutting off opportunity that you don't need to shut off by not considering some of these things, okay? One more I found important. Make your employer your employer, not your banker. I wondered why a few opportunities I lost, because I too quickly I asked for a raise. I'd only been there a month, and I said, could I have an advance? An employer says, wow, I thought we hired the right guy, but this guy needs extra money already. Can't manage his affairs, has to have an advance. So here's what I, don't make your employer your banker. Make your banker your banker. If you need a little extra money, go to your bank, go somewhere, but not to your employer. Here's why. An employer is like opportunity. An opportunity doesn't want to see your need. Opportunity wants to see your seed. So let employer be employer. Let banker be banker. Let friend be friend. I found it was a bit unwise to make a friend a banker or a relative. Do you know why you go to a minister to discuss certain things so that he won't disclose it to the marketplace? And you go to your doctor to disclose it so he won't disclose how weak and sickly you might be. So you don't bring your weekly, your sickness to the marketplace and talk about it. You talk that over with your doctor. Talk over your maladies and your problems to your doctor. So jot this down. It's called show your seed and hide your need in the marketplace especially. Show your seeds, show your willingness, show your desire, 
show your hard work, show your work ethic, show your arrive early, stay late attitude. Show that, but not your need. The marketplace is not interested in your need. Next is code of conduct. It's not a bad idea to take a piece of paper someday and just jot down what is your code of conduct. What do you expect from yourself? Some things you will do, some things you will not do. Jot this phrase down, what I want to be known for. Here's what I want to be known for. And that's not a bad list to make. As we're building our reputation day by day, week by week, month by month, and one opportunity leads to the next, leads to the next, Depend on what, depending on what we're known for. These are some of the things that may not appear in your resume. You know, you've been to school and you learned these skills and you worked for this company and you were there nine years and so on. In addition to that now, what's really important, especially for your own psyche, is to make a list of what you would like to be known for. I wanted to be known for always doing my best. I never wanted anyone to be disappointed, at least in my presentation. They might be disappointed with my ideas because they thought I was wrong. They might be disappointed with my position because they thought it wasn't right. And they might be, you know, disappointed because, you know, I didn't say what I believed, you know, was contrary to what they believed. They might have been disappointed in that, but they were never disappointed in my sincerity, never disappointed in my ability to speak from my heart and my soul. If you have charge of some of my life and you send me off to another country, I promise to represent you grandly. I promise you won't have to stay awake nights wondering about Jim Rohn if you've sent him to Paris. I want you to be able to say, forget about Paris. Jim Rohn is there. He'll take care of it in the best style. He won't show up late and he won't show up drunk. He will represent us well. So have you got that good question now? What do I want to be known for? I want to be known for being on time. I want to be known for staying late. I want to be known for not ignoring anyone. I want to be known for my unique ability in conversation as well as presentation. I want to be known for the fact that I care for kids as well as adults. I want to be known for the company's interest as well as my own. I want to be known for one who helps to feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. I want to be known. I want to be known for my leadership skill. I want to be known for my attitude. I want to be known. What would that list be if you were to make it? Here's what I want to be known for. Sometime in the privacy of your own thoughts, away somewhere, just work on that list. Here's the reputation I want to build. Now here's what's next under personal development. Under personal development, develop these five abilities. First of all is the ability to absorb. One of the big challenges for being here now, especially for three full days, some of you, it's going to be a challenge to try to get it all. But I'm asking you to do that. In another seminar I do, here's a little phrase I have. For the future, pay attention. See if you can't get everything. Every word possible, every idea possible. It's easy to let your mind wander. Right? And not really concentrate and, zig and dig in and make these days extraordinarily valuable for you. Absorb the atmosphere. Absorb the drama of the occasion. Absorb the spirit of the occasion. Absorb the reasons for coming here and then the reasons for going back home and making a difference. Absorb the variety of voices you're going to hear this weekend. And absorb the provocative ideas as well as the ones that you agree with. Absorb all of that. Take it all in. By listening intently, taking good notes, talking with each other. Here's one more. Absorb the drama of each other. You're going to have a chance to meet some excellent people here. Losers don't pay this kind of money. To come to seminars. 
The reason why the price tag is substantial is because when you get here, you'll have an excellent chance of meeting some pretty good folks. Even if they borrowed the money to get here. At least they knew how to do that. Whatever it takes. So don't go away without meeting some people. Here's the next part. Listen to the testimonials. You may pick up some ideas from someone's testimonial that will be just as valuable as what I share from this podium. And sometimes a, a word spoken in private from someone's unique testimonial is so powerful. It's just as powerful as all the words given by the presenter. So take that all home. Key, absorb the chance for a new beginning. I don't know where you are at the moment. This is sort of mid-year. First six months, getting ready now for the last six months. And as you pause mid-year to contemplate the past and think about the future, as you ponder for a while ideas that you've already heard, anticipating that you're going to hear some more, how could that create for you a new beginning? There's so many ways to create a new beginning if you just think about it. Or think about the automatic ways of creating a new beginning. Here's a pretty good list. At the beginning of the day, this is a brand new day. I love to get up early now. I used to stay up so late. I got up late. I used to say if the good Lord wanted you to see the sunrise, he'd have made it later in the morning. But, but now I don't do that anymore. I try to get to bed as early as I can. Sometimes it's not easy, especially when you travel and with jet lag and all the rest, you know, around the world. But I try to get up now early in the morning. Unique thing about early in the morning, you haven't messed up the day yet. I mean, it's just, it's just there. It's ready, fresh. It's like being born again. A new day is like being born again. A chance for a new day, a new life. You've never lived this day before. Only in your mind developing plans, but you've never actually walked into this day before. Now you have a chance to watch the sun come up and then stride into this new day. Call yourself a new person, whatever that little trick you have to learn. This is a new day for me. This is a new life for me. Next, at the beginning of the week. You know, that seventh day, I think, has more than one purpose, the seventh day. So just make the note, how to best use the seventh day. It says what? Six days of labor, working miracles, turning thoughts and faith into reality. Then after six days of miracle working, turning ideas into reality, now it says take the seventh day. And yes, the seventh day could be for spirituality. Yes, the seventh day is to contemplate God. Yes, the seventh day could be called for worship. Yes, the seventh day is to take some time off. Yes, the seventh day is to be with your family. Yes, the seventh day is change of pace. But here's a good idea for the seventh day. To go back over the last six and get ready for the next six. You just pause that seventh day. Because I have a, another little piece on that in this list of five. And maybe now mid-year, mid-year having come here for this weekend, mid-year. You can think of ways to gather up what's happened to you since the first of the year till now. The drama, the disappointments, the highs and the lows and the mixture and the stock market and whatever's happened to you, you know, these six months and say, I'm going to go home and create a new beginning. I'm not going to be the same again after this weekend. You can conclude that and I promise you, the days can be so extraordinary, you won't be able to believe it. So absorb everything. Take it all in. Don't miss anything. The sound, the music, the sights, the atmosphere. My friend Bill Bailey has this extraordinary gift. He doesn't miss anything. Better for him to go to Acapulco, come back and tell you about it, than it is to go yourself. And the reason is, if he goes, he won't miss anything. He'll soak up every detail. Every person he met, the food and the aromas and the sights and the sounds and the colors and the people and the countryside. Then he has the gift of language. When he comes back home, he can tell it to you. When he talks, you can feel the water lapping on your feet. You can smell the aroma of the food. You can see the colors and the people. 
Two gifts, to get it, second gift, to share it. And put it in dynamic words, leaving out no detail. Because here's the key to remember, the drama is in the detail. Lady tells me I've lost 60 pounds. I said, well, is that it? Is that the end of the story? She said, oh, no. Oh, no. There's a lot more to the story than that. And I said, well, I appreciate the number, but give me the details. What was going on in your life before? She says, well, misery you can't believe. I know I missed three good jobs just because I had too many pounds. And I says, well, how do you feel now? And she starts to cry. Wow, that's what I want to hear. The details, the drama is in the details. Give me the numbers, yes, but what does this number mean? For some people, the number means everything before and after. The number means so much drama you can't believe before and after. Before the day and after the day. Give me the details. Absorb. Take it in. Don't miss anything. Jim will share with you some invaluable insights and techniques to help you develop a winning mindset that can transform your life. Jim was a renowned motivational speaker and entrepreneur who inspired millions of people around the world with his teachings on personal development, success, and leadership. His wisdom and practical strategies have helped countless individuals achieve their goals and unlock their full potential. So get ready to learn from one of the greatest minds in the personal development industry as Jim Rohn shares his mindset training with you. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. What would make you an attractive person in the marketplace? So you have the best chance to get the best job, to get the best pay, to have the best opportunity, work with the best people, be welcome at the best tables of learning and enterprise, to sit at the conference table of promise and future. How do you get there? Some things to remember. This first little part I call acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Now, part of our learning affects us in the marketplace. The skills we've developed affects us in the marketplace. You might have had to go to school to work in a certain segment of the marketplace. If you're going to be a doctor, you've got to go to the proper school. If you're going to be a lawyer, you've got to go to the proper school. But there's something else now that affects us all in the marketplace that I want to deal with here. And that's called behavior in the marketplace. Not just your skills, not just your learning, not just what you know, but how you behave. Key phrase, the things that make you obviously a good person, an acceptable person, or unacceptable. First of all, all of us must study our marketplace as to what might be acceptable or unacceptable. But let's cover some of the obvious, and that'll lead to the rest of the list. I've just got three or four here to cover, and then you can think about the rest and ponder those. Here's one thing to remember in the marketplace. You must be ultra conservative in the marketplace. Ultra conservative in your behavior because this determines your future. This determines your paycheck. This determines the circles you can get into and the ones you can't get into. I've got some examples here and you'll see where I'm going. Here's number one, your language. The language you use in the marketplace has so much to do with your paycheck. Now, in some areas, that may not be totally true, where you could use bad language and tell dirty stories and cuss all day long and it wouldn't make any difference. You know, if you're around people that cuss all day long and tell dirty stories, what difference does it make? It doesn't make any difference. But if you would like to exercise your skill and ability in another segment of the marketplace, here's one thing you might have to correct or you might have to at least watch carefully, and that's your language in the marketplace. So jot this down. Be ultra-conservative in your language in the marketplace. Otherwise, you may destroy parts of the market that would gladly accept you and your product and your service if your language wasn't so unacceptable. The guy says, well, I'll tell dirty stories and cuss wherever I please, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it'll cost you. In some areas of business in the marketplace, it's going to cost you. Here's a guy that makes 100000 a year, could make 250000 easy. The other 150,000 disappears because of his bad language in the marketplace. He's unacceptable in some circles. 
They won't listen to his story, even though he has something good to share. So you see where I'm going here? Language in the marketplace. Here's what's the safest. Save your jokes for the bar or the pub. Don't put them on the marketplace. Or the inner circle, you know, where all the stories and stuff may be acceptable as you trade stories. But in the marketplace, you've got to be ultra conservative, shift gears if you have a problem, shift gears, especially in the marketplace, and make sure that it isn't costing you a big share of your marketplace unduly. Because there's no use suffering an extra hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year income simply because you're careless with your language in the marketplace. So of all the places not to be careless, it's in the marketplace concerning your language. So do you see where I'm going here? Yep. Next is habits. You just got to be careful of those. Smoking. Guy walks into an office and says, where's your ashtrays? How come you don't have any ashtrays? Well, ashtrays probably mean what? No ashtrays mean. Right? They don't smoke here. So, oh, yeah, I forgot. So what I'm saying now, I'm not saying right or wrong to smoke. I'm just saying be careful in the marketplace that you aren't disturbing and wiping out and closing the door on a market you could enjoy simply because you're a bit careless about your habits. Habits. Now, I don't smoke, so I don't have this challenge for me, except a fine cigar after a unique meal. Some places around the world still know how to prepare a gentleman's cigar. Kind of an interesting experience, mostly for show. But as long as you know which end to dip in the brandy, right? But you see where I'm going here now on habits, habits. Zig Ziglar talked about the man who was late, who was late. And I'm telling you, there's some circles, if you're late, you're not welcome anymore. You say, well, I've been late all my life. You know, if people don't like that, that's too bad. I'm saying that's okay. You can have that attitude if you want to. But what if it cost you $100,000 a year? Wouldn't you reconsider? That's too much to pay for the luxury of some habit that you could easily correct and maybe enjoy the benefits of a marketplace that's been closed up until now. This is all I'm saying. Take a look at your habits. Take a look at your language. Here's another one, your dress. Now, sometimes dress changes regionally. In San Francisco on a business day, they wouldn't expect you to look like West Palm Beach. If you dress like West Palm Beach on a business day in San Francisco, somebody will, they'll treat you casual, right? Not appropriate dress. So part of this is company, part of it is region, part of it is locality, part of it is community. What's acceptable in the marketplace on a conservative basis, what would be acceptable to everyone in San Francisco? To be dressed conservatively. In West Palm Beach, you can have a casual business dress, perfectly acceptable. The key is to find out. So that you don't cost yourself market that you could enjoy. You don't cost yourself customers that you could have. You don't cost yourself people that would gladly join and be part of it, except for these difficulties. I had to learn some of this stuff. All of us have to learn the social graces and what's acceptable. The white socks don't go with the black tuxedo. I mean, some things you just have to learn. What if a guy called on farmers in his tuxedo? See, the word would spread. You should see this clown. So now that's the severe side, but here's what I'm asking you. Check your dress. Check your clothes, check your attitude, check your behavior, check your language, check your habits, especially in the marketplace where you get paid. No use slamming the doors you don't need to slam. No use shutting off opportunity that you don't need to shut off by not considering some of these things, okay? One more I found important. Make your employer your employer, not your banker. I wondered why a few opportunities I lost, because I too quickly I asked for a raise. I'd only been there a month, and I said, could I have an advance? An employer says, wow, I thought we hired the right guy, but this guy needs extra money already. Can't manage his affairs, has to have an advance. 
So here's what I, don't make your employer your banker. Make your banker your banker. If you need a little extra money, go to your bank. Go somewhere, but not to your employer. Here's why. An employer is like opportunity. An opportunity doesn't want to see your need. Opportunity wants to see your seed. So let employer be employer. Let banker be banker. Let friend be friend. I found it was a bit unwise to make a friend a banker or a relative a banker. Do you know why you go to a minister to discuss certain things? So that he won't disclose it to the marketplace. And you go to your doctor to disclose it so he won't disclose how weak and sickly you might be. So you don't bring your weekly, your sickness to the marketplace and talk about it. You talk that over with your doctor. Talk over your maladies and your problems to your doctor. So jot this down. It's called show your seed and hide your need in the marketplace especially. Show your seed, show your willingness, show your desire, show your hard work, show your work ethic, show your arrive early, stay late attitude. Show that, but not your need. The marketplace is not interested in your need. Next is code of conduct. It's not a bad idea to take a piece of paper someday and just jot down what is your code of conduct. What do you expect from yourself? Some things you will do, some things you will not do. Jot this phrase down, what I want to be known for. Here's what I want to be known for. And that's not a bad list to make. As we're building our reputation day by day, week by week, month by month, and one opportunity leads to the next, leads to the next, depend on what, depending on what we're known for. These are some of the things that may not appear in your resume. You know, you've been to school and you learned these skills and you worked for this company and you were there nine years and so on. In addition to that now, what's really important, especially for your own psyche, is to make a list of what you would like to be known for. I wanted to be known for always doing my best. I never wanted anyone to be disappointed, at least in my presentation. They might be disappointed with my ideas because they thought I was wrong. They might be disappointed with my position because they thought it wasn't right. And they might be, you know, disappointed because, you know, I didn't say what I believed, you know, was contrary to what they believed. They might have been disappointed in that, but they were never disappointed in my sincerity, never disappointed in my ability to speak from my heart and my soul. If you have charge of some of my life and you send me off to another country, I promise to represent you grandly. I promise you won't have to stay awake nights wondering about Jim Rohn if you've sent him to Paris. I want you to be able to say, forget about Paris. Jim Rohn is there. He'll take care of it in the best style. He won't show up late and he won't show up drunk. He will represent us well. So have you got that good question now? What do I want to be known for? I want to be known for being on time. I want to be known for staying late. I want to be known for not ignoring anyone. I want to be known for my unique ability in conversation as well as presentation. I want to be known for the fact that I care for kids as well as adults. I want to be known for the company's interest as well as my own. I want to be known for one who helps to feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. I want to be known. I want to be known for my leadership skill. I want to be known for my attitude. I want to be known. What would that list be if you were to make it? Here's what I want to be known for. Sometime in the privacy of your own thoughts, away somewhere, just work on that list. Here's the reputation I want to build. Now here's what's next under personal development. Under personal development, develop these five abilities. First of all is the ability to absorb. One of the big challenges for being here now, especially for three full days, some of you, it's going to be a challenge to try to get it all. But I'm asking you to do that. In another seminar I do, here's a little phrase I have. For the future, pay attention. 
See if you can't get everything. Every word possible, every idea possible. It's easy to let your mind wander, right? And not really concentrate and, zig and dig in and make these days extraordinarily valuable for you. Absorb the atmosphere. Absorb the drama of the occasion. Absorb the spirit of the occasion. Absorb the reasons for coming here and then the reasons for going back home and making a difference. Absorb the variety of voices you're going to hear this weekend. And absorb the provocative ideas as well as the ones that you agree with. Absorb all of that. Take it all in. By listening intently, taking good notes, talking with each other. Here's one more. Absorb the drama of each other. You're going to have a chance to meet some excellent people here. Losers don't pay this kind of money to come to seminars. The reason why the price tag is substantial is because when you get here, you'll have an excellent chance of meeting some pretty good folks. Even if they borrowed the money to get here. At least they knew how to do that. Whatever it takes. So don't go away without meeting some people. Here's the next part. Listen to the testimonials. You may pick up some ideas from someone's testimonial that will be just as valuable as what I share from this podium. And sometimes a, a word spoken in private from someone's unique testimonial is so powerful. It's just as powerful as all the words given by the presenter. So take that all home. Key, absorb the chance for a new beginning. I don't know where you are at the moment. This is sort of mid-year. First six months, getting ready now for the last six months. And as you pause mid-year to contemplate the past and think about the future, as you ponder for a while ideas that you've already heard, anticipating that you're going to hear some more, how could that create for you a new beginning? There's so many ways to create a new beginning if you just think about it. Or think about the automatic ways of creating a new beginning. Here's a pretty good list. At the beginning of the day, this is a brand new day. I love to get up early now. I used to stay up so late. I got up late. I used to say if the good Lord wanted you to see the sunrise, he'd have made it later in the morning. But, but now I don't do that anymore. I try to get to bed as early as I can. Sometimes it's not easy, especially when you travel. And with jet lag and all the rest, you know, around the world. But I try to get up now early in the morning. The unique thing about early in the morning, you haven't messed up the day yet. I mean, it's just, it's just there. It's ready. Fresh. It's like being born again. A new day is like being born again. A chance for a new day, a new life. You've never lived this day before. Only in your mind developing plans, but you've never actually walked into this day before. Now you have a chance to watch the sun come up and then stride into this new day. Call yourself a new person, whatever that little trick you have to learn. This is a new day for me. This is a new life for me. Next, at the beginning of the week. You know, that seventh day, I think, has more than one purpose, the seventh day. So just make the note, how to best use the seventh day. It says what? Six days of labor, working miracles, turning thoughts and faith into reality. Then after six days of miracle working, turning ideas into reality, now it says take the seventh day. And yes, the seventh day could be for spirituality. Yes, the seventh day is to contemplate God. Yes, the seventh day could be called for worship. Yes, the seventh day is to take some time off. Yes, the seventh day is to be with your family. Yes, the seventh day is change of pace. But here's a good idea for the seventh day. To go back over the last six and get ready for the next six. You just pause that seventh day. Because I have a, another little piece on that in this list of five. And maybe now mid-year, mid-year having come here for this weekend, mid-year, 
You can think of ways to gather up what's happened to you since the first of the year till now. The drama, the disappointments, the highs and the lows and the mixture and the stock market and whatever's happened to you, you know, these six months and say, I'm going to go home and create a new beginning. I'm not going to be the same again after this weekend. You can conclude that, and I promise you, the days can be so extraordinary, you won't be able to believe it. So absorb everything. Take it all in. Don't miss anything. The sound, the music, the sights, the atmosphere. My friend Bill Bailey has this extraordinary gift. He doesn't miss anything. Better for him to go to Acapulco, come back and tell you about it, than it is to go yourself. And the reason is, if he goes, he won't miss anything. He'll soak up every detail, every person he met, the food and the aromas and the sights and the sounds and the colors and the people and the countryside. Then he has the gift of language. When he comes back home, he can tell it to you. When he talks, you can feel the water lapping on your feet. You can smell the aroma of the food. You can see the colors and the people. Two gifts, to get it. Second gift, to share it. And put it in dynamic words, leaving out no detail. Because here's the key to remember, the drama is in the detail. Lady tells me I've lost 60 pounds. I said, well, is that it? Is that the end of the story? She said, oh, no. Oh, no. There's a lot more to the story than that. And I said, well, I appreciate the number, but give me the details. What was going on in your life before? She says, well, misery you can't believe. I know I missed three good jobs just because I had too many pounds. And I says, well, how do you feel now? And she starts to cry. Wow, that's what I want to hear. The details, the drama is in the details. Give me the numbers, yes, but what does this number mean? For some people, the number means everything before and after. The number means so much drama you can't believe before and after. Before the day and after the day. Give me the details. Absorb, take it in, don't miss anything. For a life worth living. In this video, Rome draws upon his years of experience and wisdom to discuss how character is the foundation for success and fulfillment in life. He emphasizes the significance of cultivating virtues like self-discipline, honesty, integrity, and perseverance, and how doing so can help us overcome the challenges that come our way. With his unique perspective and powerful words, Rome provides valuable insights and practical guidance that can help us lead a more purposeful and meaningful life. Get ready to be inspired by the wisdom of one of the most influential speakers of our time. I believe that success comes with character and that success builds character. I don't believe, as apparently some people still do, that suffering and defeat are necessary for developing the soul. I know they're not good for the body or the mind. Failure doesn't make you feel better, either mentally or physically. Of course, it's an inevitable part of life and you do yourself a favor by taking the opportunity to learn from your failures. But I think there's no point in continuing to bang your head against the wall once you realize it hurts. I don't mean to sound hard-hearted about this, but I believe that if you reach a certain age, and if you really haven't achieved very much in your own terms, I don't think you can ascribe this to bad luck or a difficult childhood or any other external factor. I personally feel that your strength of character does come into question at that point. And let me make it clear that your definition of success may be different from the next person. I'm not implying that you need to have a fat bank account or a Rolls Royce to be successful. But if having those things is integral to your definition of success, then that's what you should be aiming for. Let me illustrate what I mean by describing the philosophy of a very successful and interesting man named Steve. Although he was still in his mid-forties, he had already founded a very profitable advertising firm in the Midwest and had sold it to one of the country's largest agencies for roughly three times his company's annual gross. So he had become a very wealthy man and he had plenty of years left to enjoy it. 
During a discussion with some friends of his, the topic turned to the career problems of a mutual acquaintance. A man of obvious intelligence who had an MBA from one of the most prestigious universities in the country, his high level of ambition had led him to strike out on his own as soon as he got his business degree. But now 15 years had passed, and his consulting firm was still hard-pressed to pay the rent on his office. Oddly, he still continued to impress everyone who met him as an extremely sharp all-around businessman. He read the Wall Street Journal every day. He knew the names of all the CEOs of the major corporations. Talk to him for five minutes and you would think he was a real player in the business world, but he had never made any money. Steve's friends were confused by the whole idea of a good businessman who's never had success in making money. They felt it was like saying someone is a great baseball player, but he strikes out all the time and makes a lot of errors. Steve thought about this for a minute and then offered his perspective. In the business arena, I believe achievement is a prerequisite for calling someone successful. You can't be a good businessman and never make any money. A good tree bears fruit. If it doesn't, it's not a good tree. I think Steve's analysis is right on the mark for a certain segment of the business arena. In certain professions, one of the highest goals you can achieve is to generate income for the company and thereby fatten your own bank account. In those businesses, success is measured by money, plain and simple. So if you're in that type of profession and you haven't made money, you probably should take some steps to strengthen your character. In other words, character isn't an abstraction that exists somewhere up in the sky divorced from the real world. There may be other things you should do also, but you should certainly do some soul searching and some character development. But let's broaden the scope of the discussion a bit and look beyond business success, where the measurement of achievement can be defined simply in terms of dollars and cents. I've already said that in my opinion you need a strong character to make money and that if you haven't made money, your character very likely needs work. But I also want to stress my belief that it takes character to achieve success in any form, whether it's in the business world or anywhere else. There are some people who just aren't interested in making a lot of money. I'm not one of them, but I can see their point of view for these people, achievement is measured in terms that aren't so easily quantified. According to Aristotle, 52 is the age at which a man's philosophy is fully formed. But it's okay to run a little behind schedule as long as you recognize it and do something about it. And you don't need volumes of books or the library in order to create a personal philosophy that will help you to achieve your goals. You can do that anywhere. You can do it right here. In fact, we could all do ourselves a favor by developing the philosophy of an ant. There are at least two reasons why ants are unique and important. For one thing, an ant always knows where it wants to go, and it keeps trying to find a way of getting there, no matter what. If you put a pebble in front of an ant, the first thing it does is try to find a way around the pebble. It tries to go one way. If it can't get around there, it tries to go the other way. And if it still can't get around, then it tries to climb over the pebble. And if for some reason it can't climb over the pebble, it will try to lift the pebble, even though the pebble may be hundreds of times larger than the ant itself. And if it finds it can't lift the pebble, it will look for other ants to help. And if all the ants working together can't lift the pebble, they will finally start digging a tunnel underneath it. And even if that doesn't work, they will literally start trying to gnaw their way through the pebble. How long will they keep trying? They'll keep trying until they die. Because the one thing they will never do is quit. That's the ant's philosophy of achievement. And we might all want to incorporate it into our view of the world. The other reason ants are important is because of what they do in the summer. During the summer, the ants plan for the winter. 
They don't have any credit cards. They don't use the present moment to create debts and liabilities for themselves in the future. They use the present moment to create assets for themselves. Do you remember the fable about the ant and the grasshopper? The grasshopper laughed at the ant for working so hard all summer. The grasshopper just enjoyed himself, leaping around in the high grass without a care in the world. And when the winter came, he starved to death while the ant had plenty to eat. Remember, we've all been grasshoppers at some point in our lives. Just make sure you're not one now. Character is the means for transforming ideas into achievements. It's somewhat abstract in the sense that you can't lay your hand on it or point to it or weigh it on a scale. But in a very real sense, character is what allows you to get where you want to go. If you want to drive from your home to a store on the other side of town, you'll need an automobile with gas in the tank, and you'll need keys to start the car. But you'll also need to know how to drive. You'll need judgment based on life experience to tell you when to step on the brakes if the light up the street changes to red. You'll need a true intention to reach your destination so that you don't keep stopping for coffee and a piece of pie every 10 minutes. You'll need to know how much time to allot to the trip so you can get home in time for whatever else you have to do. And you'll need enough maturity to call and say you're going to be late if you get stuck in a traffic jam. You can't lay your hand on any of those things and you can't measure them with a yardstick, but they're as important to reaching your destination as the car or the gas or the keys to start the engine. They are analogs of character. Let's continue this comparison for another moment or two. There are all sorts of ways to keep track of the condition of a motor vehicle. You can look at the tires to see whether they've worn out their tread. You can look at the odometer to see how long it's been since you've changed oil. And you can turn on a switch and then walk around the car to see if the headlights and the taillights are working properly. There are objective indicators of the condition of your car. Similarly, there are ways of objectively evaluating your achievements. Most people don't take advantage of them as often as they should, but they're available nonetheless. For example, you can put together a financial statement in order to determine your net worth. You can hire an appraiser in order to learn the market value of your house. You can compare where you were 10 years ago to where you are now in order to determine the degree of progress you've made in your life. As I've tried to explain, achievement depends on character in the same way that a successful drive to the grocery store depends on knowing when to apply the brakes and when to step on the gas. But how can you know if your character is in good enough shape to get you where you want to go? To continue the metaphor we've been using, there are ways of discovering whether you still know how to drive without having an accident. I believe there are ways of evaluating the strength of your character that are almost as clear as the depth of tread on a tire or the amount of gasoline in the tank of an automobile. In order to use these techniques for character evaluation, all you need is a commitment to be ruthlessly honest with yourself. At first, that kind of ruthless honesty may include a little bit of pain, but once you accept the fact that character is basic to achievement, you'll gladly pay the price. Just as the gas gauge of a car indicates full and empty, with several demarcations in between, you can learn whether your character has enough fuel to get you to your life's destination. You can learn to tell whether you're on full or empty or somewhere in between. But while a car runs on only one fuel that is indicated by a single gauge, character, in my opinion, can be evaluated by four different imaginary gauges. Here's the first one. On the right-hand side of the gauge, corresponding to the letter F for full on a gas gauge, I want you to imagine the letter R, which stands for refusal. And on the left side of that gauge, I want you to imagine the letter C, 
which stands for complacency. If your character is good and strong, there are certain things that you simply refuse to accept in yourself or in other people. In your work, you refuse to accept anything less than your best effort. That doesn't mean that things will always work out exactly as you hoped and intended, but that's not the point. There will always be variables you can't control, but your effort level should always be maxed out regardless. With your family, your commitment should be just as strong. You should simply refuse to compromise in any area where your family needs and welfare are concerned. And with yourself in your personal life, you should similarly refuse to accept pettiness or dishonesty or unethical behavior in any form. That's the right-hand side of the first character evaluation gauge. On the left hand is the letter C, which stands for complacency. But it also could be the letters LIS, standing for let it slide, or even WTDA for what's the difference anyway. Ask yourself where you stand on that scale. Do you have enough good, strong refusal to achieve what you want to achieve? If not, it's time to make a pit stop right now. The second character reading gauge has the letter D on the right, and on the left is the letter M. The D stands for decision, and the M stands for maybe. Ask yourself, are you a person who comes to a fork in the road and turns right or left? Or do you stop the car, scratch your chin, and say, well, maybe I'll go this way, and then again, maybe I'll go that way. And in the end, you go nowhere. Think about the big issues that are facing you in your life right now. It could be that you want to leave your job and start a business of your own. It could be that you want to get married. In any case, are you the kind of person who comes to a decision and puts it into action? Or are you someone who says, well, maybe, but then again, maybe not? Now imagine a gauge with a W on one side and an A on the other side. The W should be in bright red or orange, while the A should probably be a dingy green or pale yellow. That's because the W stands for want, as in, I want it now, or I want it real bad, or I want it so much I'll do whatever it takes to get it. The W means you'll go to law school for five years at night while working full time during the day because you want to be a lawyer. The W means you'll get up at four o'clock in the morning every day to work on your novel because you want to be a writer. It means you'll travel from one end of the country to the other many times in order to find a doctor who can make your child well. I know people who have done all those things because they wanted something and eventually they got it. The A stands for apathy. That's where you really don't care what happens. And if you really don't care what happens, it's just as well because it certainly isn't going to be anything good. Now we come to the last of our imaginary character gauges. On the right hand side is the letter P and that stands for promise. And on the left hand side is a letter F and that stands for fear. If you are a person of strong character, you will promise yourself that you will achieve your goals or or what? It doesn't matter because you never consider that possibility. You have made a promise and you're going to keep it. When you set out to drive to the grocery store, you don't stop at the doorway and think, what will I do if I don't make it? You simply intend to get to the grocery store. You know you're going to get there. You will get there. It's simply assumed. Fear is simply the inability to make a promise to yourself. It kicks in when you start thinking about all the bad things that can happen to you on the way to your destination. And before long, you're thinking, wouldn't it be easier just to stay home? Isn't it safer to just stay in bed? Isn't it better to pull the covers up over my head? In this discussion, we've been using the metaphor of going across town in a car. Let me conclude by referring to another little excursion. 
and it's one that I know for a fact you have already taken. When you were learning how to walk, you made a silent promise to yourself that you were going to do it. It may have been scary at times. You surely stumbled again and again. Tears surely fell from your eyes, but no matter. You didn't even think about that. Each time you fell, you forgot about it as soon as you regained your feet because you had promised yourself you were going to walk across the room, and you did it. How long did it take? Who cares? You did it. Building a strong character for a life worth living. In this video, Rome draws upon his years of experience and wisdom to discuss how character is the foundation for success and fulfillment in life. He emphasizes the significance of cultivating virtues like self-discipline, honesty, integrity, and perseverance, and how doing so can help us overcome the challenges that come our way. With his unique perspective and powerful words, Rome provides valuable insights and practical guidance that can help us lead a more purposeful and meaningful life. Get ready to be inspired by the wisdom of one of the most influential speakers of our time. I believe that success comes with character and that success builds character. I don't believe, as apparently some people still do, that suffering and defeat are necessary for developing the soul. I know they're not good for the body or the mind. Failure doesn't make you feel better, either mentally or physically. Of course, it's an inevitable part of life, and you do yourself a favor by taking the opportunity to learn from your failures. But I think there's no point in continuing to bang your head against the wall once you realize it hurts. I don't mean to sound hard-hearted about this, but I believe that if you reach a certain age, and if you really haven't achieved very much in your own terms, I don't think you can ascribe this to bad luck or a difficult childhood or any other external factor. I personally feel that your strength of character does come into question at that point. And let me make it clear that your definition of success may be different from the next person. I'm not implying that you need to have a fat bank account or a Rolls Royce to be successful. But if having those things is integral to your definition of success, then that's what you should be aiming for. Let me illustrate what I mean by describing the philosophy of a very successful and interesting man named Steve. Although he was still in his mid-40s, he had already founded a very profitable advertising firm in the Midwest and had sold it to one of the country's largest agencies for roughly three times his company's annual gross. So he had become a very wealthy man and he had plenty of years left to enjoy it. During a discussion with some friends of his, the topic turned to the career problems of a mutual acquaintance. A man of obvious intelligence who had an MBA from one of the most prestigious universities in the country. His high level of ambition had led him to strike out on his own as soon as he got his business degree. But now 15 years had passed and his consulting firm was still hard pressed to pay the rent on his office. Oddly, he still continued to impress everyone who met him as an extremely sharp all around businessman. He read the Wall Street Journal every day. He knew the names of all the CEOs of the major corporations. Talk to him for five minutes and you would think he was a real player in the business world, but he had never made any money. Steve's friends were confused by the whole idea of a good businessman who's never had success in making money. They felt it was like saying someone is a great baseball player, but he strikes out all the time and makes a lot of errors. Steve thought about this for a minute and then offered his perspective. In the business arena, I believe achievement is a prerequisite for calling someone successful. You can't be a good businessman and never make any money. A good tree bears fruit. If it doesn't, it's not a good tree. I think Steve's analysis is right on the mark for a certain segment of the business arena. In certain professions, one of the highest goals you can achieve is to generate income for the company and thereby fatten your own bank account. In those businesses, success is measured by money, plain and simple. 
So if you're in that type of profession and you haven't made money, you probably should take some steps to strengthen your character. In other words, character isn't an abstraction that exists somewhere up in the sky, divorced from the real world. There may be other things you should do also, but you should certainly do some soul searching and some character development. But let's broaden the scope of the discussion a bit and look beyond business success, where the measurement of achievement can be defined simply in terms of dollars and cents. I've already said that in my opinion, you need a strong character to make money. And that if you haven't made money, your character very likely needs work. But I also want to stress my belief that it takes character to achieve success in any form, whether it's in the business world or anywhere else. There are some people who just aren't interested in making a lot of money. I'm not one of them, but I can see their point of view. For these people, achievement is measured in terms that aren't so easily quantified. According to Aristotle, 52 is the age at which a man's philosophy is fully formed. But it's okay to run a little behind schedule as long as you recognize it and do something about it. And you don't need volumes of books or the library in order to create a personal philosophy that will help you to achieve your goals. You can do that anywhere. You can do it right here. In fact, we could all do ourselves a favor by developing the philosophy of an ant. There are at least two reasons why ants are unique and important. For one thing, an ant always knows where it wants to go, and it keeps trying to find a way of getting there, no matter what. If you put a pep... in front of an ant, the first thing it does is try to find a way around the pebble. It tries to go one way. If it can't get around there, it tries to go the other way. And if it still can't get around, then it tries to climb over the pebble. And if for some reason it can't climb over the pebble, it will try to lift the pebble, even though the pebble may be hundreds of times larger than the ant itself. And if it finds it can't lift the pebble, it will look for other ants to help. And if all the ants working together can't lift the pebble, they will finally start digging a tunnel underneath it. And even if that doesn't work, they will literally start trying to gnaw their way through the pebble. How long will they keep trying? They'll keep trying until they die. Because the one thing they will never do is quit. That's the ants' philosophy of achievement. And we might all want to incorporate it into our view of the world. The other reason ants are important is because of what they do in the summer. During the summer, the ants plan for the winter. They don't have any credit cards. They don't use the present moment to create debts and liabilities for themselves in the future. They use the present moment to create assets for themselves. Do you remember the fable about the ant and the grasshopper. The grasshopper laughed at the ant for working so hard all summer. The grasshopper just enjoyed himself, leaping around in the high grass without a care in the world. And when the winter came, he starved to death, while the ant had plenty to eat. Remember, we've all been grasshoppers at some point in our lives. Just make sure you're not one now. 
character is the means for transforming ideas into achievements. It's somewhat abstract in the sense that you can't lay your hand on it or point to it or weigh it on a scale, but in a very real sense, character is what allows you to get where you want to go. If you want to drive from your home to a store on the other side of town, you'll need an automobile with gas in the tank, and you'll need keys to start the car, but you'll also need to know how to drive. You'll need judgment based on life experience to tell you when to step on the brakes if the light up the street changes to red. You'll need a true intention to reach your destination so that you don't keep stopping for coffee and a piece of pie every 10 minutes. You'll need to know how much time to allot to the trip so you can get home in time for whatever else you have to do. And you'll need enough maturity to call and say you're going to be late if you get stuck in a traffic jam. You can't lay your hand on any of those things and you can't measure them with a yardstick, but they're as important to reaching your destination as the car or the gas or the keys to start the engine. They are analogs of character. Let's continue this comparison for another moment or two. There are all sorts of ways to keep track of the condition of a motor vehicle. You can look at the tires to see whether they've worn out their tread. You can look at the odometer to see how long it's been since you've changed oil. And you can turn on a switch and then walk around the car to see if the headlights and the taillights are working properly. There are objective indicators of the condition of your car. Similarly, there are ways of objectively evaluating your achievements. Most people don't take advantage of them as often as they should but they're available nonetheless. For example, you can put together a financial statement in order to determine your net worth. You can hire an appraiser in order to learn the market value of your house. You can compare where you were 10 years ago to where you are now in order to determine the degree of progress you've made in your life. As I've tried to explain, achievement depends on character in the same way that a successful drive to the grocery store depends on knowing when to apply the brakes and when to step on the gas. But how can you know if your character is in good enough shape to get you where you want to go? To continue the metaphor we've been using, there are ways of discovering whether you still know how to drive without having an accident. I believe there are ways of evaluating the strength of your character that are almost as clear as the depth of tread on a tire or the amount of gasoline in the tank of an automobile. In order to use these techniques for character evaluation, all you need is a commitment to be ruthlessly honest with yourself. At first, that kind of ruthless honesty may include a little bit of pain, but once you accept the fact that character is basic to achievement, you'll gladly pay the price. Just as the gas gauge of a car indicates full and empty, with several demarcations in between, you can learn whether your character has enough fuel to get you to your life's destination. You can learn to tell whether you're on full or empty or somewhere in between. But while a car runs on only one fuel that is indicated by a single gauge, character, in my opinion, can be evaluated by four different imaginary gauges. Here's the first one. On the right-hand side of the gauge, corresponding to the letter F for full on a gas gauge, I want you to imagine the letter R, which stands for refusal. And on the left side of that gauge, I want you to imagine the letter C, which stands for complacency. If your character is good and strong, there are certain things that you simply refuse to accept in yourself or in other people. In your work, you refuse to accept anything less than your best effort. That doesn't mean that things will always work out exactly as you hoped and intended, but that's not the point. There will always be variables you can't control, but your effort level should always be maxed out regardless. With your family, your commitment should be just as strong you should simply refuse to compromise in any area where your family needs and welfare are concerned. 
and with yourself in your personal life. You should similarly refuse to accept pettiness or dishonesty or unethical behavior in any form. That's the right-hand side of the first character evaluation gauge. On the left hand is the letter C, which stands for complacency. But it also could be the letters LIS, standing for let it slide, or even WTDA for what's the difference anyway. Ask yourself where you stand on that scale. Do you have enough good, strong refusal to achieve what you want to achieve? If not, it's time to make a pit stop right now. The second character reading gauge has the letter D on the right, and on the left is the letter M. The D stands for decision, and the M stands for maybe. Ask yourself, are you a person who comes to a fork in the road and turns right or left? Or do you stop the car, scratch your chin, and say, well, maybe I'll go this way, and then again, maybe I'll go that way. And in the end, you go nowhere. Think about the big issues that are facing you in your life right now. It could be that you want to leave your job and start a business of your own. It could be that you want to get married. In any case, are you the kind of person who comes to a decision and puts it into action? Or are you someone who says, well, maybe, but then again, maybe not? Now imagine a gauge with a W on one side and an A on the other side. The W should be in bright red or orange, while the A should probably be a dingy green or pale yellow. That's because the W stands for want, as in, I want it now, or I want it real bad, or I want it so much I'll do whatever it takes to get it. The W means you'll go to law school for five years at night while working full time during the day because you want to be a lawyer. The W means you'll get up at four o'clock in the morning every day to work on your novel because you want to be a writer. It means you'll travel from one end of the country to the other many times in order to find a doctor who can make your child well. I know people who have done all those things because they wanted something and eventually they got it. The A stands for apathy. That's where you really don't care what happens. And if you really don't care what happens, it's just as well because it certainly isn't going to be anything good. Now we come to the last of our imaginary character gauges. On the right hand side is the letter P and that stands for promise. And on the left hand side is a letter F and that stands for fear. If you are a person of strong character, you will promise yourself that you will achieve your goals or or what? It doesn't matter because you never consider that possibility. You have made a promise and you're going to keep it. When you set out to drive to the grocery store, you don't stop at the doorway and think, what will I do if I don't make it? You simply intend to get to the grocery store. You know you're going to get there. You will get there. It's simply assumed. Fear is simply the inability to make a promise to yourself. It kicks in when you start thinking about all the bad things that can happen to you on the way to your destination. And before long, you're thinking, wouldn't it be easier just to stay home? Isn't it safer to just stay in bed? Isn't it better to pull the covers up over my head? In this discussion, we've been using the metaphor of going across town in a car let me conclude by referring to another little excursion, and it's one that I know for a fact you have already taken. When you were learning how to walk, you made a silent promise to yourself that you were going to do it. It may have been scary at times. You surely stumbled again and again. Tears surely fell from your eyes, but no matter. You didn't even think about that. Each time you fell, you forgot about it as soon as you regained your feet because you had promised yourself you were going to walk across the room and you did it. How long did it take? Who cares? You did it. 